Members, the sitting is resumed. It is time for questions to the Minister of Education. I must inform the House that question 2, 4 and 6 have been withdrawn. I call Mr William Humphrey. Question number 1. The term to take action to break the link between social disadvantage and educational underachievement wherever it exists. I have the correct policies in place and these are beginning uh, these are being implemented with renewed vigour. I have provided additional resources to schools serving those most at risk of underachieving. Funded programmes have been implemented to improve literacy and numeracy outcomes. I have also provided funding to support programmes aimed at improving school community links. The Education Works programme highlights the vital role parents can play in helping their child do well at school and improve their life chances. I am encouraged when I see communities where formal education has not traditionally been prized, now recognising education as the path to success in the future. Other programmes impacting positively in addressing educational inequalities and underachievement include the revised SAIN and inclusion framework, the full implementation of the entitlement framework, Sure Start, the Early Years Fund, and Achieving Belfast and Achieving Dairy Bright Futures programme. <coughs> However, while some schools persist in the use of academic selection, we will be unable to eradicate social division. The political proponents of social and academic selection must start accepting responsibility for all its outcomes, especially for working class children. The challenge of tackling inequalities, be they educational, health or economic, is one that we all face and success will depend on all stakeholders working together in order to achieve greater equality in our society. Mr. Humphrey for a supplementary. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. I thank the Minister for his answer. And I also thank the Minister for the interest he's taken in the education in the Greater Shankill North Belfast area. The Minister will be aware of the Children and Young People's Zone in Greater Shankill. He will also be aware of the recent report by the Equality Commission, which presented uh, uh, inequalities in terms of education and based on data, which is um, 2011 and 12. Recently, my colleagues and I met with Alan Logan and Emlyn Wright from the two model schools. <clears throat> Will the Minister join with me in congratulating principals of those two schools and Hazelwood uh, College in North Belfast in terms of the leadership they are giving? And can I ask the Minister uh, if he is prepared to give greater resource for the retention of the extended schools programme, which is so hugely needed in constituencies like North Belfast, Inner East and South Belfast and West Belfast? Um, uh, well, firstly, I have no difficulty in acknowledging the hard work of the principals and the schools you have mentioned. Um, uh, it's clear when you see connections between schools and communities, the educational well-being of the children in the area improve, and, and, and there's many good examples of that. I have increased funding to schools in areas of social deprivation uh, quite significantly over this last year, and it will take a while for that money to be uh, managed in a way which sees the, the positive outcomes for the children we want to see. So we're not, I'm not expecting an immediate return on that. That will take. Uh, over a number of years, and schools and the department and the education authority are working together uh, to plan towards that. In relation to extended schools, in very difficult budgetary times, I have done my best to protect that budget. Uh, we face another difficult budget scenario uh, for 16 17 and indeed beyond. But as long as I am in post, I can assure you that I will do my utmost to protect the extended schools budget. Call Mr. Chris Hazard. I can I thank the Minister for his answer thus far. Uh, and can I welcome the, the original questioner's um, acceptance and welcome, I suppose, of the effect of targeting social need in areas such as the Schenkel. But of course, remind the questioner that you know, he voted against changes to the common uh, funding system and that it's important to show leadership. So I ask the Minister, how is it now important to show leadership, especially when it comes to academic selection in areas such as the Schenkel? Um, well, as I said in my original answer, if you support academic selection, you have to support all outcomes of academic selection. And the evidence clearly shows that academic selection has a detrimental impact on those young people from socially deprived areas. So if you support it, what people may argue, and I, I don't know what the positive outcomes are, but people tell me there's positive outcomes. If you support those, then you also have to acknowledge that the negative outcomes from academic selection also exist. And there's much evidence based to, to show uh, the detrimental impact they have. Uh, in fairness, and, and the, the, the Shankill was mentioned uh, by the original questioner, the community sector and the community organisations in the Shankill have taken ownership of education in the area. I was at a programme launched the other night, or a report launched the other night of West Belfast, where the West Belfast community and schools have been working together. And the results coming out of post-primary schools there are very, very impressive. And it's all down to cooperation. It's all down to working in partnership. It's all identifying each other's strengths and weaknesses and being prepared to work together. So, yes, leadership is vital both in the school, in the classroom, and also in the community and the political 
uh, forum to ensure the best outcomes for our young people. Call Mr. Sean Rogers. Speaker, and thanks to the Minister for his answers thus far. Minister, could I ask what professional op opportunities are there for our teachers to upskill in terms of literacy and numeracy? And be made aware of the good practice that's out there. You know, my concern would be that many of the good projects, say, for example, achieving Belfast, achieving Derry, that is not disseminated out well enough. Well, numeracy and literacy is a core skill uh, in, in teaching, and it is a core skill within our education system. So, yes, I, I acknowledge the need for continuous professional development among our teaching workforce but it should be across a wide range of areas, and core skills should be updated, but certainly they should be there from the very start. Uh, one of the lessons from the Delivering Social Change programme, where we brought in newly qualified teachers into our school as, a, as an additional resource, which were either used directly as a numeracy and literacy support, or allowed a more experienced, more qualified teacher out to deal with numeracy and literacy. Those experiences are now being shared through the ETI, through the inspectorate, uh, among schools to ensure that best practice is delivered uh, among our schools as well. And I think we have to, as, as our resources become more and more stringent, we have to reach a point that where we're using our main resource as the key lever to eradicate uh, educational underachievement, uh, to eradicate numerous and literacy problems, rather than seeking out schemes or additional, bonus, or additional funds moving forward, we will have to start using our core funding more strategically, more effectively, ensure we're getting a return on well, Mr. Chris Little. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Does the Minister agree that education, health, community and business sector partnerships are key to improving educational outcomes, and what type of support can he give to the Eastside Learning Partnerships, Eastside Learning Framework, as he has uh, positively done to the Full Service Community Network in North and West Belfast? Again, Eastside is another positive development, uh, not only in terms of community infrastructure, but also in terms of education um, outputs. And I have attended a number of events by them. I've also met the group as well. And I am impressed with their work and their involvement in education in communities. There's a lot of good work going on out there. And it's worth noting that from 2007, the percentage of young people leaving our schools with five good GCSEs has risen by almost 10%. So the policies, the commitment, the work is beginning to pay off for our young people. Uh, in relation to those young people on free school meals, the percentage of young people leaving schools with five good GCSEs or more has risen by almost 8% in the same time frame. Now, we have a lot of work to do there, but we are seeing uh, the graph move in the right direction, and there are many, many different aspects as to why that is the case. Mr. William Irwin. Question number three, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. A new bill for Market, High School, Market Hill High School was considered for my June 24 capital investment announcement. Unfortunately, the proposed project did not pass one of a number of gateway checks on the basis that the enrolment level at the school was below the sustainable schools threshold. Should there be a further announcement for either the major capital or school enhancement programmes, then the school will have the opportunity to reapply uh, for consideration at that time. Mr. Irwin for supplementary. Uh, thank the Minister for his response. Um, uh, the Minister did say that the enrolment level was not high enough. The, 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 the Market Hill High School is at its absolute, absolute uh, maximum in relation to the level of pupils uh, that they accept. And would the Minister accept that Market Hill is High School has consistently delivered some of the best results anywhere in Northern Ireland? What is required uh, in relation to Market Hill in our mass city area is an area planning solution to ensure that we know exactly uh, the makeup of the school estate going from this point forward. And that will allow either myself as minister or successive ministers to be able to invest in the RMR Market Hill area. At the moment, we do not have an area plan for the secondary post primary sector, and I would encourage everyone involved. Uh, to, get it, to come to a conclusion on the discussions around that. And yes, I do congratulate the school on its excellent exams. Well, Mr. Cockle Boylan. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Could I ask the Minister what projects are currently in the major capital programme in the Newry and Armagh area for a middle market? First question. Uh, there are several programmes of, of spend going on in the Newry and Armagh area. 
For instance, in terms of the current position of school enhancement projects, you have St Patrick's Grammar School, Armagh, is on site, Our Ladies Grammar School, Newry, Roth Orr Special School, Newry, uh, the Armstrong Primary School, Armagh, has been, the tender has been awarded. Uh, two of the major projects are currently on site, one is at a feasibility stage and one is at a business case stage. St Joseph's Convent Primary School, Newry, St Clare's Convent and St Coleman's Abbey Primary School, Newry, and St Joseph's and St James Primary School, Points Pass, and St Joseph's High School, across McGlen. There is an estimated uh, value of around £44 million worth of capital investment in the Newry Armagh constituency, either on site or moving to, uh, towards going on to site uh, in the foreseeable future. Mr. Danny Kennedy. Member, uh, uh, to the Minister for his uh, earlier answers, albeit uh, they are somewhat disappointing. Uh, could I also declare uh, an interest, uh, Mr. Principal Deputy, Deputy Speaker, in that my wife is employed at Market Hill High School? Notwithstanding that, Will the Minister uh, accept that, um, the, that the news he has given to the uh, Assembly today will be uh, 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 greeted with great disappointment, given that Margaret Hill High School is a very well-regarded and high-achieving school in the mid arma area? And can he look again at the criteria, because simply the, the School of State at Margaret Hill uh, is no longer uh, 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 in, in proper or fit condition to uh, educate those peoples who are already there? Um, thank you, Member, for his question. I understand that my statement today will come as a disappointment to Market Hill High School, though I do not think it will come as a surprise because they, they, they were aware of the situation. Though there are many schools within our schools the state which require significant investment or complete rebuild. And the way we've been moving forward over this last number of years is through the area planning process, ensuring that when we are investing quite significant amounts of public funds in the schools of state, that we can be confident that the school is situated in the right area. And I'm not suggesting anything around the Market Hill. I'm just, this is a broad answer rather than specifically uh, to Market Hill or Armagh City. And that we know the numbers which the school will be caring for going into the future. And that has to be based on an area planning solution. And as the members are aware, and other members representing the constituency, constituency will be aware, there has been a long-going stop-start discussion around the future of education in that region. And I would encourage political representatives from all political parties to use their influence to ensure that those discussions come to a conclusion and that the needs of all the young people in that area are met moving forward. It will allow this minister and future ministers to be able to invest in the area. Well, Mr. Dominic Bradley. Last can call you, August Gum, Buyakas Lishanara, as Octan Fragra, Hokshe, Eran Kesht, Ira Heshaw. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister for his answer. Um, he did refer to area based planning in relation to Market Hill High School. But would the Minister agree with me that um, area based planning in the South Armagh area uh, has been, as it were, completed, and that there is good cooperation between St Paul's High School, Newton Hamilton High School, and St Joseph's High School, Cross McGlen. And can he give us an indication uh, of the progress that has been made uh, in bringing forward a new bill for uh, St Joseph's in Cross McGlen? Valor and Kesh. Thank the member for his question. I have already announced a new bill for St Joseph's High School in Cross McGlen, and one of the you pointed out as to why I, I could make such an announcement, because area planning has progressed in the South Armagh area. Uh, there has been engagement between the various schools. We do know uh, what size of schools the state we mo need moving forward, and we therefore we can invest in it. So my announcement on St Joseph stands. There is preparation work moving forward uh, towards that new build. Well, Mr Oliver McMullen. Um, case ever a Kruger, question five. Over the last number of weeks, I have met uh, NITC, the Teaching Council representatives, on three occasions, and I am encouraged to report a short acknowledgement that teacher judgment is the best means of determining and reporting on a child's progress, and growing acceptance that the application of standards through moderation is intended to assist teachers to use the levels of progression in the classroom with confidence. Excuse me. <coughs> Excuse me. I have listened to the views and concerns of the NITC and they have listened to mine, and more importantly, I have demonstrated that I am prepared to act to address them. 
With that in mind, and given our common ground, it is my view that there can now be no possible justification for continued industrial action in this area. On the 22nd of October, therefore, I wrote to the Teachers' Council, representing all the unions, uh, setting out the significant steps I am prepared to take on the end of key stage assessment arrangements from 15-16, recognising that assessment arrangements must evolve as they embed. In return, I request that the NITC agree to bring the current industrial action in relation to assessment to an end, following allowing us to move forward together. I am encouraged to note that the NASUWT has now suspended its industrial action in relation to statutory assessment. I understand that the INTO and the UTU have written the schools successful in the first call for application for shared education signature project, advising that they can now comply with the assessment process. I would encourage those teachers' unions still on industrial action to give this matter their urgent attention. To McMullen for supplement. And can I thank the Minister for his answer? But could the Minister play, uh, outline, if any, the individual unions that responded to your proposals? Um, the individual unions that have responded thus far, those that have responded in a positive manner are the NAS, NASUWT, the INTO and the UTU. ATL have advised me that they are, they are going to continue their industrial action. And the National Association of Head Teachers were not involved in this specific industrial action. So we have made progress. I think if other unions follow the examples of those thus far, it will give us space to continue discussions. It will also allow the assessments to begin. And as I have repeatedly said during my discussions with the unions, that we need to allow this process to begin. And it, it will evolve. It will evolve over a period of time to ensure that we all want, and this is what we all want to do, to ensure that we get the uh, achieve the best education possible for our young people, and we have the correct, correct way of recording and use of data for that purpose. Mr. Peter Weir. Thank you. Yeah, Mr. De Principal Deputy Speaker, can I ask the Minister, um, in light of the, at the heart of this, seems to be a lack of confidence around uh, levels of progression as a means of assessment. When the Minister talks about an evolving situation, is one of the uh, bits of evolution that has to occur is examination of alternative means of assessment as we move forward? Well, I'm not keen to examine alternative means of assessment moving forward when we haven't even used the current assessment processes that are in place. And around the, the edges of the concerns, or around levels of progression, around the edges of that, I've been able to deal with the vast majority of con genuine concerns raised by the unions. But as I, as I said to Mr McMullen, and I'll say again, for this process to evolve, it has to begin. And for it to begin, then we have to, and I welcome the fact that a number of unions are suspending their industrial action, we, we let it begin, discussions between my department and the unions continue, and we achieve an assessment process that meets the needs, first and foremost, of the young people, our education system, our teachers, and our Department of Education and all other bodies. I was recently in Wales and Scotland, and I, I had the opportunity there to discuss through various forms of assessment, both with the Welsh Minister and with the Scottish Minister, and they vary. Uh, in Scotland, they use a test, and they may be moving to a singular test. Uh, in Wales, they're using an assessment process as well. Uh, so there's different examples of how this can be achieved, but I think to give confidence to the system, let, uh, I welcome the suspension by some of the unions. Let's get the process moving forward. And that's ensure we end up with an assessment that we're all satisfied with. Mrs. Sandra, over. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and uh, I thank the minister for the, the uh, response on this matter. And I'm, I'm sure uh, I'm not sure if I couldn't hear it all uh, with the speakers here uh, in this part of the chamber. But I wonder, could the minister? Sorry. <laughs> uh, it's more to do with the sound system, I think, more than my colleagues. Yeah, yeah, I must say. Yeah. Um, but could, I wonder, could the minister? Uh, clarify, is there a change to what the schools have to do as part of the statutory process going forward? Yes, because we have had discussions, or I have had discussions with the unions, and I have listened to their concerns. Uh, moderation was a concern. Uh, I, I outlined to schools that moderation will now take place within the school, and moderation will take place among a cluster of schools in that area to assure that each school's uh, marking regime is fair, adequate, and is understood by the schools around them. So what level schools use for each element of work will actually be worked out among, firstly within the school and then the schools surrounding them. What the data is used for. 
There was concerns among the unions that the data would be used as a blunt tool to target schools on the basis of that data that they were underachieving. I have reassured the schools that will not be the case. I have asked for data to be returned in a way which, to my department, which will not allow me to identify individual schools, but which will allow me to identify trends across our education sector to be used to ensure that our, our policies are the correct policies and we are achieving the traction which we all want to achieve. So those are just two areas. The, 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 the portfolio, concerns about the workload around the portfolio, I have engaged with the unions around that. Uh, and I believe the measures we have brought into place will ease the prices around the teachers' workload as well. Now, but for, there are many, many different views on what type of assessment you should use. Some would argue that you use a simple test, and there are systems that do use a, 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 a test. In Scotland, the different authorities may use slightly different tests, and there may be a proposal to bring forward a single test. But the concerns raised there are my concerns around the test. You then teach to the test. Whereas what I'm trying to achieve here is that the assessment is based on the professional judgment of the teacher from work of the curriculum, which the child will be doing within the class. Teachers were concerned that, well, maybe we'll score it right, but the school down the road, they'll not score it right. I think if we bring together them in clusters, they discuss and they debate what a level two or a level three or a level four looks like, then there will be confidence among the schools as to it's being scored correctly. But as I constantly I've said it during this question time. We need to have the assessment in place for it to evolve into what we want it to achieve. And I think now that the unions have suspended their industrial action Remind in a the round. Minister of the two minute rule. Okay. Call Mr. John Dallet. Thank the Minister for his answer. Perhaps in simple English and in using no more than two syllable words, would the Minister agree with me that the levels of progression were used as an accountability measure? and therefore eroded any possible use they might have had as an assessment or learning tool. What is wrong with a Department of Education or an Education Authority having an accountability mechanism? How do we ensure that our young people are receiving the educational opportunities they should receive? I make no apologies whatsoever for seeking accountability tools. I have sat in front of the unions and told them I make no apologies for seeking accountability rules. It's, why, it's how that accountability tools are used which are cause of concern to the unions, and the unions in fairness to them as well, are not shying away from accountability either. It's how and what purpose accountability is used for, and they were concerned that levels of progression would be a blunt tool to identify schools through who, in, under the, the levels of progression which can be identified as underachieving and therefore all the power and force of the Department of Education falls down upon them. I have assured the unions that is not the purpose of them. I have put changes in place will ensure that is not the purpose of them. The purpose of levels of progression is to ensure that our young people's education is up to the standard it should be, measured by teachers. Ms. Bromden McCarkin. Question 7. The inaugural meeting of the Careers Advisory Forum took place on the 12th of November 2015 and feedback from the day has been very positive. Minister Forey and I established the forum in response to a recommendation for an independent review of the career system. The forum's role is to advise both departments on current and future careers provision and facilitate engagement between employers, educators and other key stakeholders, both at a system level and a local level. Membership is made up of representatives from business, education and other stakeholders such as parents. It is chaired by Judith Gillespie and I am grateful to Judith for taking on this challenge and important task. McGuckin for supplement. I thank the Minister for his, his response. Could I ask the Minister for a potential time frame for the implementation of the recommendation, recommendations pertaining to DE from the, the, the report? Um, my, myself and the Dale Minister are working our way through the recommendations. Uh, I am due to meet the Dale Minister shortly uh, for, for some further clarification around uh, the recommendations, etc. So um, th those discussions are continuing. And I, I can't put a, a time frame on it, but I can assure you that we are working with the Dale Minister around that report. Well, Mr Gregory Camp. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, can the Minister reassure the House and the public that uh, at the Careers Advisory Forum, 
uh, sufficient steps will be taken to ensure that uh, suitability and appropriateness in terms of uh, positions, both in the public and private sector, will be borne in mind when uh, schools are actually looking at the projects? Well, uh, I, I would want to reassure the member of that. Uh, if the member has any issues of concern or specific issues which have caused him concern, he's more than happy to engage with me uh, after question time. But uh, to date, I've had no reason to believe that there's nothing other than complete professionalism taking place at the forum, and the work of the forum uh, will be professional in its uh, delivery as well. Mr. Robbins. Thank you very much, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. And I thank the Minister for bringing this forward as a recommendation from the Employment and Learning Committee's inquiry into careers. Can I ask him, has he considered the recommendation we brought forward as to making careers a statutory obligation and the potential of putting that in at maybe years 10, 12 and 13? Um, as I've said previously, uh, I'm reviewing all the recommendations uh, from the Dell Career Strategy and will uh, respond to them in due course. Call Mr. Chris Hazard. Kishan Rahaklin, hold question number eight, please. Across the education sector, we continue to deal with a very challenging uh, budget situation. The additional 15 million in your allocation will be spent equally on schools maintenance, special education, and funding. Uh, the drawdown of school surpluses. Schools maintenance is an area of the budget that continues to be under pressure due to an ageing schools estate. The additional allocation will be used to address outstanding health and safety maintenance issues. Special education is also a growing cost pressure within the education sector, and therefore additional funding will assist special education needs for pupils in both mainstream and special schools. In June 2011, the executive agreed that the school surplus scheme, which allows schools to either draw down or increase their surpluses, and this is funded from a central pot controlled by the executive. The five million allocation to fund schools surplus drawdowns enables those schools who wish to reduce their surpluses during 15-16 to fund in-year expenditure. I am committed to protecting and, where possible, enhancing frontline services in education. I therefore welcome this additional £15 million, which will go some way in easing the financial pressures within education. Mr. Hazard, for a supplementary. I'm a great last and thank the Minister for his answer. He made reference there to the, the central pot for school surpluses. Perhaps you could detail how much is in that central pot. Currently uh, held within that central pot is £36.7 million. Pounds. This is surpluses built up by schools over a number of years and can and should be drawn down uh, to assist the schools in delivering the educational provision their young people require. It's quite a significant amount of money. Uh, it has largely stayed in around the same amount over this last number of years, even though we have been through a very, very difficult budgetary period. I would encourage schools to keep their surpluses to a minimum. I would encourage the schools to use their surplus to assist the educational needs of their young people. Now, obviously, I do not want to run on the bank. I do not want uh, a £36 million download at this stage. But certainly over the next number of years, surpluses is an area that will require further and more detailed attention. Mr Gregory Campbell. Uh, number nine. Uh, since 2012, five primary schools have been submitted for consideration of major capital announcements. These are Bally Kelly Primary School, the Stress Primary School, which is part of the amalgamation of Mullaboy PS and Craig Brack PS, Mill Strand Integrated Primary School, Port Roche, Roe Valley Integrated Primary School, and St Patrick's Primary School, Port Roche. Of these, two schools have been announced to be advancing the planning for a new build. These are the Stress Primary School, announced in January 2013, and Roe Valley Integrated Primary School, announced in June 2014. Mr. Campbell, first up. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, given it, it is early days since the working tax credit uh, sum of money is coming to some $240 million over four years, uh, has landed on the executive's desk, but has the minister had an opportunity to turn his mind to any application uh, for sums of money? from that source to try and further some of these capital build programmes? The member will be aware that uh, the money that was set aside for tax credits is revenue. I am seeking capital, though I did look upon the Chancellor's announcement and did note that capital is increasing for the executive, and I will be putting a major lobby on to increase the, the Department of Education's capital fund uh, for the next year. We did take a dip this year. And I will also be seeking uh, revenue for education from whichever source I can achieve it. Now, the executive, I understand, will be discussing what we do with 
uh, the around £250-£260 million pounds set aside for working tax credits. I will involve myself in those discussions, uh, and I can assure you that I will always have an eye on getting more money for education. It ends the period for listed questions. We now move to topical questions, and I call Mr. Kieran McCarthy. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, since the introduction of the Autism 2011 Act, uh, is the Minister uh, satisfied that his department has lived up to expectations from parents and guardians with children with autism that they can get the education most suitable to their needs when they need it? Uh, yes, I, I do. I believe that we, um, we have policies in place which, by and large, deliver for the needs of our young people and families with autism. The member will be aware we are introducing the SEND Bill for consideration stage tomorrow to the House, which I would hope to see an improvement in deliveries for educational services across the entire range of young people with special educational needs. And I will also, and the member will also be aware that the £5 million we received as part of the November monitoring round will also a great, go a great way to easing some of the pressures in around this area as well. Mr McCarthy for a supplementary. I thank the Minister for his response and I very much welcome the extra funding going into this uh, sector. Uh, but is the Minister aware that um, this is the most important uh, aspect of parents and guardians when they come to seek uh, education for their youngsters? It is frequently uh, not available and certainly not available when it should be available and delay is and has been the big bugbear for people with for parents uh, and children with autism. Um, well, I, I don't necessarily agree with the statement that it's frequently not available. We have many, many fine special educational needs schools out there servicing uh, the needs of our young people, including those with autism. We have many autism uh, classes uh, within and provision uh, within our mainstream schools as well. And I do, uh, but I do accept where there has been delays, where the system has let families and young people down, it is totally unacceptable. And we have to continue to improve our delivery of services uh, to the most vulnerable in our society. I hope the same bill goes a long way towards doing that. I have uh, ring fenced and protected special educational funding over this last number of budgets. It will be my intention to do so again in the future. And I will, as I said, I will always continue to seek further funding uh, for special educational needs as well. Call Mr William Humphrey. Thank you, Mr. President. Deputy Speaker, thank the Minister for his answers. Minister, you may be aware that both the Girls' Model, Boys' Model, and Hazelwood College were oversubscribed this year. The Girls' Model, in particular, oversubscribed for nearly 30 uh, young ladies. Uh, given that the population in the local primary schools in North Belfast and Greater Shankill is growing, this is a problem that will remain and indeed will continue to be a problem. Can I ask the Minister to? agree to look at the variation of the intake numbers for these schools to allow more local people to get into local uh, delivering secondary schools? Well, there is a number of ways of dealing with this, firstly in terms of uh, the number allocated to schools each year. and We write out to each, the schools every year asking them do they require or seek a change to their entry number, either to increase or decrease, and they have to give a rationale to that, or a development proposal being brought forward to uh, manage area planning needs within the area, uh, but that is a matter for the Education Authority. Mr Humphrey for supplementary. Uh, thank the Minister for his response, and, and I, I welcome the Minister's answer, but I would just make one point uh, to the Minister. It is very difficult for principals, and as I have said earlier in my question, in question time, we have met with the local principals for them, for them to do planning whenever they have not got the numbers to actually facilitate the young people who are being drawn from across Belfast because of the lack of state uh, secondary schools. Well, well, I'm not putting the entire responsibility on the principals. Uh, the schools are run by boards of governors, uh, and there's a role here for the boards of governors uh, in this program as well. And when I talk about uh, area planning, I'm talking about from an education authority level. These are controlled schools. The education authority is responsible. They should be planning uh, for the future needs of young people in that area or any other area. And if there's a shortfall in terms of numbers projected, then I would expect the Education Authority to bring forward plans to rectify that. Call Mr. Trevor Clark. Thank you very much, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker. Following on from that question, uh, Minister, you will be familiar with the recent uh, PAC report in relation to places and how those were calculated. Would the Minister like to make any comment on actually how his department actually gathered the data in relation to those places? Uh, as a former chairperson of the Public Accounts Committee, I know it is worth more than my job to comment on a report before. 
uh, the Department and the Department of Finance has had a chance to formally respond. Mr. Clark, first supplementary. Well, then, uh, as a former chairman, you'll be aware, maybe in this particular report, it does indicate that this, the figures were actually inflated and does not allow for modern teaching methods. And the figure then that you use in your department in relation to the number of empty places is actually a false figure. And what is your department going to do to rectify that and actually printing an accurate figure in relation to whatever the schools estate has? Well, I, I don't want to go into the specifics around the, the PAC report, uh, but. Whatever figure you use, we have too many empty school places. But we don't use the universal figure when we're judging the school's estate in any area. For instance, if a development proposal comes forward to me to close a school, we will have accurate, up-to-date figures for each of the schools in that locality. And we will know then what exactly empty or full places there is in those schools. If a proposal comes forward to me to open a school, I know what the, the accurate, up-to-date data is in each area to do so. so Whatever the universal figure may or may not be, I will respond to the PAC in due course on that. The way we develop our schools of state is with up-to-date data and information. So therefore, I believe that we can accurately reflect uh, the positions in any area when making decisions around area planning. Call Mr. Sean Rogers. Thank you, Mr. Sp Mr. Speaker. Thanks to the Minister for Santos so far. Recently, Minister's uh, concern was expressed about the cost of the education budgets of PPP schemes. What, do you share this concern, and particularly has there been any um, renegotiation of these contracts? Um, the original PPP schemes were actually a subject of a PAC committee report uh, during my time there. And yes, uh, lessons have been learnt from the original Pathfinder PPPs. I have not involved, or the executive have not involved themselves, to the best of my knowledge, in any PPP schemes during this mandate. If we are to move into that territory, then I think we will have to take uh, best practice from elsewhere around these islands and perhaps across Europe as well to ensure that the public sector is the beneficiary of it rather than simply the private sector being the beneficiary of it. In terms of renegotiating contracts, no, we have not an opportunity to renegotiate contracts. They are contracts. They are legal contracts. And I could spend quite a significant amount of time hiring legal and other expertise to renegotiate something, or I can move forward and trying to deliver the services with the limited resources I have. Mr. Rogers, for supplementary. Could I thank the minister for his answer? Uh, officials at a recent education committee said that over 50% of their costs were utility costs. Can you maybe outline what, what they really mean by utility costs? Well, it, it depends on each contract for each school. Uh, I assume what they are referring to is in terms of service levels agreement uh, with the schools around keeping. The, the, the school in pristine condition. And I have to say, I have been around a number of PP projects that are several years old uh, with very, very busy uh, schools, and they're pristine. They are like the day they were built. Now, I, also, I have a major maintenance backlog, uh, and when I walk around a PP project and see how well they're kept, I know I'm not having to spend any maintenance on those. So there is offloading costs in terms of maintenance against utility costs, etc., but I'm more than happy to supply the member uh, with a full breakdown of what that terminology covers. Call Mr Gregory Campbell. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Can the Minister give a brief outline on the work expected of the controlled sector support body, please? Um, it's set out in terms of an executive agreement uh, that the, the controlled sector support body there is to support controlled schools in the delivery of education to give them a coordinated voice and a coordinated approach on areas of concern and opportunity. Mr Campbell for supplementary. So would the Minister then be content if the support body uh, was to ensure for the present and the future that parity of funding in terms of capital and revenue was uppermost and foremost in their mind and hopefully concentrating this Minister and future Ministers' minds on that aspect as well? Well, well the, the, the work programme around keeping parity for myself will be very short, uh, because my record speaks for itself. Uh, I have published, I, I have published uh, criteria for new school builds. I have made announcements around new school builds based on that criteria. And while there are many cases of legislation take, uh, take place in education, I have never once been challenged in the courts over any decision I've made around a capital build. So I, I, I think that speaks for itself, that my, that my processes are open, transparent, and that people may not always like the decisions, but they do realise that people are getting a fair deal. Call Mr Gordon Lyons. Uh, thank you. 
Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, uh, Ida McGee needs a new primary school. Uh, this is something that I have uh, already uh, raised uh, with the Minister. In 2014, the Minister said that a development proposal for the amalgamation of Kilcoan and Mullock Dew primary schools was approved in 2004, and this is still in place. He then said it would be a matter for the NEELB to implement the approved uh, proposal, and the two schools should be brought together. Kilcoan and Mullock Dew uh, are in the process of being amalgamated and, and will be uh, from September 2016. However, they are going to be operating on separate sites. Uh, will the Minister give an update on uh, funding for a new build for the new Isla McGee Primary School? Um, I was just looking through my notes. Was I, uh, I think one of the members I did not get to in terms of questions may have a question in around this. Um, I'm more than happy to give the member uh, a written update in relation to the building programme here. I did announce it previously. Uh, there was a change of mindset within the then Education and Library Board, which meant that the programme was delayed. Uh, there has been many twists and turns in the road around these schools. Once I have definitive decisions in front of me, we can then move on towards ensuring the school receives a new build. Mr. Lyon for supplement. Can I, can I thank the Minister for uh, his answer? And further to that, th this is an issue that's been going on for, for the best part of a decade. Uh, so, so further to his answer, would he commit to meeting with me, other elected representatives and members of the Board of Governors so that we can discuss uh, why uh, the new build for Isla McGee should be a priority for his department? I'm happy to do so. Call Ms. Dolores <clears throat> Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Minister, you'll be aware of the considerable challenge of the amalgamation of St. Michael's, St. Mary's, and St. Paul's in Lurgan. And uh, there, there is, I understand, a bid in for a two site in inter interim development bid in advance of a new school being built at the site of St. Ronan's. Could the Minister give us an update on that? Well, I'm also aware of the huge opportunities that have arose as a result of the amalgamation of those three schools. Uh, I have to say it's heartwarming to see the young people in the Catholic sector in Lurgan, uh, attending all the one school in the one school uniform. Uh, and, and I think that that's, that's a major step forward for education in the area. Uh, any proposal brought forward to me in relation to a two-site solution ahead of uh, a full build, which I have announced, and there will be a, a new build uh, for that school, will be looked at uh, against any other prices we may have at the time. Ms. Kelly, for a supplement. Um, thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. I wonder, in the interim, would the Minister write to me formally to let me know just when a decision might be reached or when he may consider in relation to uh, the development proposal, which I understand is with the Department uh, as an interim measure uh, before a new school is to be built on the site of St. Ronan's, which was announced, let's face it, by your predecessor in 2010? Well, uh, I think you'll find that I announced the new build for. No, I think you'll find now. I think you'll find it was me uh, uh, that announced the new build uh, because the, the development proposal was only approved um, two years ago, f two years ago for the schools to amalgamate uh, as well. So yes, announcement has been made. Progress is being made, moving towards a new build, which will quite be considerably, perhaps one of the biggest schools in our portfolio, uh, and will provide educational for future generations in that Lurgan area. But no, I'm more than happy to write to the member to update her on the current position. Call Mr Alex Maskey. Hi, Gorm Maggot. Uh, Pre Vlad Concorda, could I ask the Minister could he outline uh, what lessons can be learned from uh, for other areas following the release of the Erasmus Polycentric report on educational achievement in West Belfast? I think an, any community who are interested in raising educational outcomes for the young people should study uh, that report and listen to the testimony of teachers, pupils, community activists in that area as to how them working together, uh, breaking down the, the, the barriers of concern about sharing best practice between schools, etc., and ensuring that they are working with the community has been to the benefit of young people in West Belfast. Mr. Maskey for a supplementary. I can thank the Minister for that. Could I ask the Minister, could he, as he has been doing for some time now, uh, continue to give leadership in respect to working with all of the other relevant educational authorities and agencies to try to make sure that we do roll out such successful uh, programmes in the future? Um, well, one of my themes throughout my time as Minister has been to say that despite having excellent teachers and excellent school leaders, we can't, they cannot do this on their own. If we are to raise educational outcomes for young people, particularly in areas of social deprivation. 
It has to be a community involvement. And the, the old African saying that goes somewhere in the wrong lines, it takes a village to raise a child, is very apt in these circumstances. Because the, the Erasmus uh, study uh, shows that where schools work together and self-evaluate, and that's, I think that was one of the main findings, was that schools were self-evaluating their own work and sharing their best practice with neighbouring schools coming together through area learning communities, both at post-primary school, nursery school and primary school, and ensuring that everyone felt comfortable and involved, and working with the community sector uh, has ensured that the qualifications for young people coming out of West Belfast are on the up every year for over the last five to six years. And when you look at all the socio-economic indicators in West Belfast, they tell you that young people in West Belfast are disadvantaged that they are most likely to be disadvantaged in their educational outcomes. What has actually happened there is that the community and the education sector have refused to set the destiny for those young people and have set out a pathway and a work programme which has given them excellent opportunities in life. That ends the period of questions to the Minister for Education. We now move to 